287, being recorded March 30th, 2020. Welcome to Gaming and BS, a tabletop RPG podcast. I'm Sean. I'm Brett. How you doing, folks? Glad to have everybody here. Before we get into um, announcements, I think, well, we played a couple of games this last weekend. You had the virtual Gary Con stuff, and then we had a chance to play Astonishing Swordsman and Sorcerers of Hyperborea with the one, the only, the Tim Shane. And I gotta say, I gotta say that uh, Astonishing Swordsman's game was pretty fucking awesome. I had a good time with that. A lot of fun. The folks who were in on it, you know, Wayne, Curtis, uh, Jeff, and uh, oh, let's see, that Hobbs guy, you, me. It was fun. Damn fine time. And uh, I, I, I said this on my Twitter posts and other social media spaces, but I think Tim did a great job. I've read enough of the setting, as I said when we had Tim on the show. I know enough about it, and I was ready, ready for the environment. I knew kind of how I wanted it to feel, and I thought Tim did a bang-up job, so... Thank you, sir. That was very well, very well done. Sean, what, after we had talked about it, and that's the first time you'd played it as well, did you um, did it hit your expectations, or were you like, huh, that's what that's about? Or something in between, maybe. I did feel as though it met expectations. Um, I mean, when I say feel right, is like it felt like Tim and Brett were talking about last time. It didn't have, the, oh, this is just another Forgotten Realm setting type of thing. Correct. Yes, I would agree with that for sure. Good, good, yeah. good, good. Yeah. Um, I think Tim did an excellent job with capturing the overall feel of what Sound of Machine Swordsman is, or sort of such such hyperborea <laughs> what it's all about. I mean, little cult action, evil gods. I almost died but went insane instead. It was good. Yeah. That's was pretty cool. That's true. That's right. Wayne did die. First guy. First. He's the only one who did die. And he, uh, he, he died big time. He got cut in half. <laughs> I, I did like Sean's, I'm a cleric, quote unquote. And I'm like, he's a fucking bard. He's got to be a bard. He's got to be a goddamn bard. Yes. Turns out son of a bitch was a bard man, the whole time. I don't know time. what you're talking about, man. The bard and cleric's vestments. Mm-mm-mm. All right. So... I did not have any other gaming uh, besides getting prepped. I've got two games this week with my home group. I'm running my Avalon game, The One-Eyed Raven, story, uh, title of that one, tomorrow. Kicking that off with my boys. And then Dungeon of the Mad Mage on Thursday. But you, you, Mr. Sean, had some other games I'm interested in hearing about. You played uh, Low Fantasy, I believe, and you also played Labyrinth Lord. It all started on uh, Thursday when I... Uh... Thursday? Could have been. Who knows? Thursday. It's a blur. When I uh, played Delta Green. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, man. How'd, how'd you like it? I liked it. It was uh, it was good. Forrest tied it into actual, the, the, the end of the mission. Uh, he turned it into, or tied it to an actual event that occurred. Nice. Yeah. And then, of course, we got to narrate the end of of our kind of arc, like what, what our characters went on to do. Oh, cool. At Very least cool. the survivors. And so because we blew up a large portion of Central America, creating an earthquake. Oops. Uh, of course, some were guilt-ridden and found themselves feeling guilty and then subsequently going down maybe not such a good path where my character he went on to continue service in the military eventually uh become a poster child for the republican party and then an actual candidate for senate oh uh, yeah interesting US, u.s senate um yeah and he you know through some of the wheelings and dealings he had Kept in touch with some of those old guys from uh, that mission. And Back in the day. They, they were part of a, they were like donating money to causes. And so I would help do that. 
okay. kind of on the, on the sly. But uh, yeah. So let me ask you this. Now that you played it, I had a feeling that after you played this, you might say, oh, I should have been running Delta Green with Doc and the guys. The reason I say that is because those guys like Shadowrun, and this has a more Shadowrun type feel, in my opinion, where you've got a, a mission, a thing to do, black ops type of deal. At least it can. So do you think that would go over better than masks with that group? Uh, yeah, I could see maybe. I, go over is relative, but I think that they... Well, I'm saying action, man. Yeah, there is more action. Because you look, you, you snoop, you poke around, you pull data, and then fuck it, you shoot people. Or you get shot at. Things blow up. Right. Which isn't normal in your regular Call of Cthulhu game, at least not as often. No, that's true. So I... But, yeah, it was fun. It was great. I had a really good time. It was a three-hour short uh, adventure mission. I definitely could see where I would, uh, given my background, turn that sucker up to about 11. <laughs> not that – and I'm not – that's not a knock on force to Gary by any means, but, you know, I – What's the style thing, man? Well, yeah. I mean, they were like – he gave pre-gens, and I didn't really look at the pre-gen as far as, like – um, what weapons I was assigned? Like oh, I was a okay. shotgun breacher guy, right? So, yeah, yeah. you know, I went through I went through a full loadout. Like, Ferris Force is like, well, you know, if there's anything special that you want, let me know. And I just went through and equipped my guy as if I was that guy. Like, I well, all right, I need an M16, a two, I need tool, I need this, yeah, I need this, flashbangs, I need <laughs> two canteens, you know, wow, uh, two. Uh, First aid pouches. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Backpack. Prick 77. You know, all this stuff. So Cool, man. Yeah, it was fun. What did you do? What'd you, oh, sorry. Go. No, I was going to say that, but going into what you were getting at, then Saturday morning, 8 a.m., uh, played in Jason Hobbs's um, game, Whitestone Tower. Was that the low fantasy? Um, hold on a second. I got an echo coming. Shoot. Uh, it is. Okay. So we talked a little bit about Low Fantasy as the pre-game bullshittery for uh, the Astonishing Swordsman's game that Tim ran. And I remember hearing about it before going, huh, that seems interesting. It seems like it might be a, a Brett jam, and I never got into it. So um, I think Wayne, um, hopefully Mr. Lumberunner, is going to hook me up with a co his copy of the rules that I can um, borrow off of him and read. So that's kind of very nice of him. Not kind of, it is very nice of him. However, Hobbs said on the show, and then afterwards, he's like, man, I love that game. I said, okay, cool. But I want to know what you thought about it. And because when I hear about it and I read it, um, or read about it, that's kind of like I said with Astonishing Swords, me like, oh, I have a vision in my head. You may not know all the mechanics and the rules or whatnot behind Low Fantasy, but what was your impression? Did it feel? As advertised, right? Like the outside of tin says, low magic, gritty realism type of thing. And you look inside and you go, hey, yeah, look at that. Doesn't have many marshmallows at all. Or how do you, what would you think? I th for Hobbs' game, it was good. Um, well, I'm not talking about how good the game was. Wait, it's Hobbs. He runs a good game. Yeah, yeah. Ha -ha. I'm talking about the game itself. Like, did you like it? Did you have fun with the low fantasy setup? I did. And. The thing is with the game itself, because it was in Roll20 and the player character sheets were really well done, there wasn't a ton of um, knowledge needed about the rules. Okay. Right? So if you rolled for initiative, you'd click the initiative die roller, and then Hobbs would just explain, because in that game, there's success, great success, or failure. And it's dependent upon your target creature on whether you need a success or a great success to go before it. Okay. Right. So I didn't need to know what that meant. I didn't need it. I would just click a button, right? Where in the rules, it would say, well, you have a target number. This target number is on your character sheet. It's derived from this. And when you roll it, 
and you go above it, it's a success. If you go above it by this much, it's a great success. So literally it would just be like, great. it would tell me the numbers, but I wouldn't even look at it. It would just, I would look at the end result. Got it. Yeah. Okay. But did you like the, uh, the, the mechanics overall, as far as fun, it felt, did it feel low fantasy to you or did it feel like, eh, it was just D and D with less rules or different rules? What'd you think that way? Um, because it, 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 it had some skills still to it. Um, there was an, a little bit of an element to to that component um, that that did. So it wasn't like okay, here's basic, and you don't have any skills, and you're narrating everything. So it wasn't BX, O D and D type of thing. Okay, all right. I, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Totally makes sense. All right. But you had fun with it. You liked it. I did. Then you played Labyrinth Lord as well, correct? I did play Labyrinth Lord. Um, that was Paul Wolf. Uh, so tournament I've, style. Okay. I've not played Labyrinth Lord. However, I have always heard really good things about it. Did it strike you as, oh, that's a neat... That's a neat OSR clone, or wow, that's something I want on my shelf, type of thing. Or, or it's good. I get. I. I. I mean, I'm giving you far too many one. You know, either all in or out, all out options here. But did you like it enough? That you would contemplate playing it again, running it, or. So one of the things I've had a personal peeve, if you will, with some retro clones is I'm like, house rules as far as the eye can see, right? Where they feel very much like blah but and I, I can't tell some of them apart in play at least that's how it feels sometimes so i'm curious as to did was this because i've heard labyrinth lord people said oh it's like bx and i've said, heard, heard people tell me no it's like 80 and no it's more like blah 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 or whatever so what was your take off of it after you played um i would say it's the way so I have Labyrinth Lord and I have okay. it from the Kickstarter and the the basic and it has the basic and advanced versions in it. And the advanced versions unlocks certain classes that weren't in the basic, like I think assassin, maybe illusionist. I have to look. The race as class or class plus race? I think it's racist class, if I'm not mistaken. I know people that are like OSR are just like probably, if I have that wrong, are just jumping through All right. chaos right now. But, um, you know, I it's it, I couldn't get a hold of that, my head wrapped around it myself, Brett, because it's not like basic expert to me. It, at least it didn't feel like it. I think the way Paul ran it, it did. Okay. But... When mm. I was creating my character, I'm like, oh, okay, there's these things. Like, there was a little bit more to it than just, I'd have to look, man. I'd have to reference both. All right, both. so now that this is not a knock against Game Master or player. So if anybody takes this conversation as such, I apologize. That's not my intent. I think it's interesting to me sometimes that I'll, I'll run a game or I'll play a game. And sometimes I'm like, oh, that was interesting. But it doesn't really stick with me. Or I'll read a game system, and sometimes I think when some of them don't stick with me, like some of the OSR clones, is because I read through them and go, huh, that's basically Swords and Wizardry, except it does initiative different. I'm making that up. Or it's a lot like, um, you know, I, I don't know, Osric, except, or whatever the case is. It just, it needs to be different enough for me to want to grab onto it that it doesn't feel like a house rule off of X or something. I don't know. I guess it's got to really kind of grab me. And that's why low fantasy seemed interesting enough to me because it reminds me a little bit from what I've been reading of kind of how DCC slaps the OSR chassis on a fairly newish game system mechanic wise. And I uh, think low fantasy seems to do a similar piece. It's taking the feeling and whatnot, but still putting that onto a newer game system uh, chassis. So anyway, all right, cool. I'll have to find me a copy of Labyrinth Lord, read it, and see what I think about it. If nothing else, maybe pick up the PDF because I know they're relatively cheap and uh, scope one of those out. Okay, cool, 
cool, cool, cool. It was fun. We didn't do very well in the tournament, but eh. you know, what are you going to do? And you know, honestly, I didn't know it was a tournament until you just told me today. So sometimes tournament play to me, at least in my brief experiences with tournament modules and such, there's so not always the best way to find out if you like a system. Because sometimes there's tournaments can have constraints or strangeness about it that aren't quite the same as a regular game you'd play with your friends. So yeah, interesting. Okay, cool. Don't want to beat that one to death too long. Um, is the the survey done? Jump over that. The survey is done uh, as of the end of this recording, and so you and I will have to take a look at the results of that and see what we want to do. On top of that, I may add that I emailed my my masks group, and they were because they were like, "Hey, man, we're playing Tuesday, or, or are we? Like, what's going on? You know, you haven't." updated us on what you want to do so i emailed them and said hey i'm gonna hang up the game for the time oh excuse me the time being because i've got too many balls up in the air for the most part so i was there was a disappointment uh is what it what say that again were the were the players disappointed like i'm responding really like i literally emailed them this morning and said hey i'm gonna hang up the game for now i'm willing to play Every other Tuesday, but just not running. I don't have the time to dedicate to it because I do want to get games off for Patreons. Nope. Yep. I hear you. Or patrons, I should say. Mm-hmm. Um, and what that looks like, and then yeah, what and everything else that I got going on, which isn't a ton, but. Dude, shit, uh, shit adds up, man. It does. Yeah. It does not take much. Well, and it wouldn't take much to just to fire up Zoom and go, okay, we're going to play. Ready? Okay. And then just, all right, last time we left off, you're in New York City and you're dealing with this. So. Yeah, but also if you're kind of like meh on the game yourself right now, what's the point of pushing it? Yeah. And it's kind of what you sound like you were last time, so. A little bit. All right. So having said that. I don't mean mean to analyze you there, brother. I'm sorry. But having said that, I think what's going to happen is we will, Brett and I are going to come together, figure out what we want to do and how we want to run games. Mm -hmm. We'll run them online, um, obviously. And then whether we're doing one shots, mini campaigns, West Marches style. Yeah. You know, because that'll lead up time. Points of light type. We'll see. Gotcha. Okay, cool, man. All right, so survey's done. Uh, that's enough of that bullshittery. Let's go on to random encounter. Yeah, random right encounter. Let's just move in. Random encounter, segment of the show where we handle emails, voicemails, and comments from social media. Uh, you re- you want to read this one, Sean? You seem down. Maybe this will pick you up. All right. You seem a little bummed out, man. Saul comments, referencing a few previous episodes. So... He writes, so I live in San Jose and I'm under a shelter in place order. Uh, Woohoo. More computer games and online RPGs, but I'm a grocery clerk, so I get to go to work. First of all, everybody out there, be safe. You included, Saul. Absolutely, man. And I'll tell you what, that I hope I hope people are treating you well. I hear some horror stories about people treating folks in your line of work quite shittily and uh May a pox land upon anyone who does that to thee, sir. Yeah. Carry on, Joe. I haven't written to you guys in a while, so I have a few short comments on a few previous episodes. Books, articles about RPGing that I have that I have read. Uh, I really only bought one, and that was Never Unprepared, which I thought was really good. It had some great ideas of cutting down your prep and focusing your time on what is really needed. Other than that, I come from the Brett side of ga- GMing, from the seat of my pants, I used to prep like crazy, but now I just come up with cool problems and have the PCs figure out a solution. That makes sense. I like it. Yeah. Kickstarters. Well, I don't think I do very many, but my wife, Jolene, always laments my Kickstarters. <laughs> I like physical books. I like RPGs that I find interesting. I like something that I don't already have in my, in my according to my wife, vast RPG collection. 
I have kickstarted Avalon by your bud Brett. Oh, sweet. Thanks, man. Pad- uh, Paladin, uh, Aquilair, Aquilair, Conan, uh, RPG Zine, John Carter of Mars. I've been extremely lucky that I have gotten everything I pledged for. Pretty cool. The practice episode, so referencing the practice episode, um, let's see, he says, uh, well, I probably have over 10,000 hours of RPG playing, but I have been playing since 1978 and haven't really ever stopped. I don't think you need 10,000 hours to be a good RPG player or a game master. What you need is to get rid of all the adult inhibitions uh, you learn from uh, inhibitions. Learn from your GM mistakes and play with various GMs and see if people have a fun time. See what and how the GM facilitates that fun that fun time. Audio. So he goes to the audio episode. I've always wanted to do audio, but only every once in a while have I done something online, but nothing more than background music. One of my friends ran a con game where he had a person just help it with the audio, a dedicated audio dude. It was amazing, but most of us don't have that audio dude in your back pocket. Innovations in the RPG industry. Wow, this one blew my mind, Sean. I think we gamers have not been all that imaginative in this area of gaming. I'm happy just to get a PDF with, uh, uh, with bookmarks. I think the best one I ever had was Nova Praxis, but I still get PDFs that don't even do simple bookmarks. I really like your ideas, and somebody, sadly not me, should work on some of your ideas. I thought they were quite brilliant. Anyway, BNS, stay safe, stay healthy, and see you on the other side of the COVID-19 crisis, Saul. Thanks, man. Yeah, I appreciate thanks, you still listening and uh, taking the time to write, man. That is awesome. Good input, too. Was. Okay, let's see who we got next. Bruce comments on innovation in RPG delivery. This one is a really interesting subject. Now, I'm not a developer of any kind and have only a layman's understanding of most of the tech, but I can see all kinds of challenges and only a relatively small audience for a new, potentially online, publishing format for RPGs. I'd love to see it happen, though. I just imagine you can get that perfect solution together that allows publisher to, to combine text, images, video, hyperlinks, maps, layered maps compatible with a, ride, with a wide range of virtual tabletop systems, tokens for the same, sound effects, and music. How would you market it? Do you keep it for your own RPG product, assuming you're a publisher? That would be narrow-minded and likely to more fragmented market space. Would you license it out to other publishers for a fee? Maybe, but bear in mind that many RPG publishers are tiny do-it-yourself operations. Would you make it freely available in the hopes of becoming the new format and effectively replacing PDF or other ebooks? Awesome, but then you have to swallow a pretty hefty development cost. It's a great idea, but I suspect the cost of developing the perfect solution may mean we're stuck with PDFs for a while yet. Incidentally, Purple Sorcerer's DCC modules are really great in PDF. Most come with an appendix that contains stuff intended for printing, paper minis, maps, often with and without battle grids, and handouts but it's also relatively easy to grab images and use them to make tokens and maps for online play. Bruce. You know, I think one of the things that I'm noticing coming out of this, and we said it ourselves, and Bruce saying it here just underscores it for me, is this shit's expensive to make, and I get it. And it, every time I hear the phrase, the RPG industry, I chuckle because it's a hobby. It's a hobby industry. It's not an industry like manufacturing computers or an industry like, you know, making women's clothing or making furniture or or making electronic equipment or something. It's not or the car industry and so on. It's a very niche piece. And I'm certain that other components of the publishing of the book publishing and so forth out there are probably passing our hobby by. But because it's a hobby industry and as you know, as Bruce points out, do it yourself operations, that's not easy to, to, to foot those bills or put that time in, you know, because it's a part-time thing that people do. So I get that. And that totally makes sense, Bruce, what you're saying. So I'm, I'm buying what you're selling there. Yeah. Good stuff to hear from Bruce from across the pond. He ran a butt ton of games this past weekend. Oh my God, did he ever? Yeah. yeah. A lot of virtual Gary Con stuff going on for Bruce, yeah. which is cool. Great stuff. All right. You ready? I'm ready. Let's get into the main topic, shall we? Yeah.
All right, Sean, here we go. So, <clears throat> Mr. DeShane did this, and it got me thinking when he was running Astonishing Swordsman and Sorcerer Piper Borea. He did a lot of dice behind the screen. Like, hey, my character was a scout. I picked a scout. I wanted to sneak. He said, what's your... I said, I got a 6 and 12 chance. I said, do you want me to roll that? He goes, no, I roll those. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And he had a number of those type of um, listen checks and so on that he would roll for us and then give us the how, what, what you got out of it. And I freaking loved it. Um, when I was picking locks, he goes, you would know if you open the lock, that's on you. Okay, cool. I get to roll my pick locks thing. So that was kind of neat. But when he rolled, when I'm listening at the door, what do I hear? You don't hear anything. Okay. And there was a piece of me that's like, I wonder if Tim rolled for shit or if Tim's fucking with me. Maybe he's fudging. I mean, there's nothing. Ah, you know, so all that wonder was in my head. And I really liked it. And so we're talking about those things where, you know, your ninja's moving silently. Your street samurai is trying to hear if there's anything behind the door. Wizard trying to spot the hidden treasure in the library. Or you're trying to smooth talk a guard or something. So we've talked about this a little bit before. And Sean and I have mentioned doing it. And quite frankly, Tim was one of the only game masters that I can remember in recent or distant past that have done it successfully to me. And I, I think he put the time in to make sure that he had all the, all the stuff written down. But it really worked, and I thought he implemented it very well. And I know some people hate it when the game master rolls any dice for the players. And vice versa. I mean, there's games like Cypher System, which basically all the dice, uh, it's all player-facing. You know, even uh, Gumshoe, from a large part, is very player-facing. Player We've talked about that before, too. So, Sean, let's talk about this a little bit. I want to kind of bring back the, should the Game Master be rolling checks for the players? Is it a, it, yes, but it depends perspective. Is it a only in certain systems type of thing? So, what do you think, Sean? It, when what, did you like did you like having Tim do that or? Yeah, I think the way that he handled it was done really well, um, in my opinion. But um, it's, I guess did add to the game for you. Besides going, oh, that's a kitschy thing that Tim does. Did it, it added to the game for Brett? Now that doesn't mean it worked for you, right? I looked at it and went, ooh, mystery. I don't really know. I'm going to have to go with this intel that the game master is telling me. This is kind of cool. Did you have that same feeling, or were you kind of like, "Man, it's just a thing"? I did. Um, I didn't have a lot of those experiences like you did, Brett, because I wasn't. Um, you're too busy trying to convince us all you're a priest. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the instances that you're a game master and you are determining who makes the role of the dice. Like Tim, obviously, I think many game masters or dungeon masters that have been doing it a little, little while have their own system of doing things. So when they say, oh, yeah. if somebody's going to search, it's always going to be me or it's always going to be them, depending, or they're going to have conditions around or the criteria around how they make that decision on the fly, Okay. So with Tim, he's probably got his nail down and he rolls that that way. I didn't have anything where if I had to make a check, it would warrant me not knowing the result as a player character. So even looking, okay then, so you didn't have that exact experience as I did because it was happening to my scout. Did you enjoy the fact that I wasn't like, hey, the interaction that Tim and I were having was cool to you? Did you think, hey, that's cool that Brett doesn't roll that die? Oh, yeah. I liked how it flowed for sure. And I do like the fact that, you know, Brett as Brett would not know whether he succeeded or not. And he could play accordingly, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. I think it, to me, it's interesting because when you talk about on the one hand, we'll say, hey, this is cool. Because in this particular interest, in, instance, I'm listening at the door, right? Thief's there, press the ear to the door. Tim rolls the dice. Do I win? Do I not? Do I succeed? What do I hear? He tells me I hear noise or I don't, what type of noise, how, and all that good stuff. And keeping some of that hidden encouraged me as a player 
to play differently. And actually, for me, it helped me play what I think was better for Brett anyway, is that I had a harder time having to take knowledge, meta knowledge, and transfer it into confidence. And by that, I mean, if I would have failed, oh, I rolled a, I rolled a 12, fuck. Well, I guess there's nothing behind this door. Do, 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 do. You know, that's <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of how I grew up in in the gaming sphere is that if you rolled to do a thing and you failed. Yeah, I know I'm supposed to play like I don't know. So I'm going to walk in with a finger up my nose. Do, do, do. Oh, my gosh. Where did these orcs come from? Oh, I never heard a thing. Too much noise to hear anything. Ha ha ha. It, and it took that kind of bad joke out of my mind. And I had to, for me anyway, it really facilitated Brett as player being more in the in the moment as my character and trying to figure out what I'm going to do. What, what what do I do if I hear nothing? Well, I started playing the guys fairly cautious. I'm like, you know, he's cautious, so he's not the kind that's going to kick the door in regardless. But I'll open the door and, you know, go into the room. I didn't bother to warn the rest of the party, like, hey, I didn't hear anything, but get ready just in case type of deal, right? So for me, it encouraged me to play different slash better. Then if I would have rolled the dice, failed the fucking thing, and I would have, I know me, I would have made some stupid meta joke and then tried to get back into character and, and pretend like I didn't know any better, right? And this way, it's, I really didn't know any better. And I, I liked that. I thought that was a cool, it was a cool piece. And I do know with some of my, uh, some players I've had over the years, even some of the guys in my group, some depending on, like, if your dice are bad, Sometimes you kind of give up. Like, look, look, whatever, whatever. I don't know. I don't hear anything. Of course I don't. Look at this. My dice fucking suck. It can be a downer. And again, it has this meta impact to the player and how they're reacting and acting. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying, Sean? Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. And, and you know, there's a good point Hobbs puts up um, that mentions, like, it works well with skill checks because it doesn't. It, it prevents multiple players from saying, oh, I'll, I'll try the same thing, right? Because they don't know whether you've passed or failed. So it, it does. Yeah, there's no skill dog piling. Why, right. why are 10 people going to listen at this fucking door? That's skill just stupid. Dog, skill dog piling? Yeah. Yeah, that's hilarious, man. Yeah, yeah. Write that down. Skill dog Actually, I still, uh, Matt Colville used it, and oh, I have used it before. I see. So it's not just a, it's not just a breath thing other people have used it. I gotcha. I actually got it from, I can't remember who in my group said it ages back. Stop fucking dogpiling. I'm like, what? What? Oh, wow. That's what you mean. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, that's a good point. Like, I never even thought of it because I think by saying, oh, well, roll. Oh, I got a four. It, auto too. it automatically, it's like, it just triggers something in everybody's brain. Oh, I try. I try. I try. Okay. Yeah. Where like a search, like a search check, right? Yeah. I rolled a four. Fuck it, I'll try. I can try. I got a search. I, I rolled a twenty. Yeah. What do I search? Yeah. And it's not. It's so weird that it's like conscious or subconscious that th happens because when you when it occurred with you, I mean, nobody. I don't know if everybody had the uh, quote unquote ability to do it or the skill to do it, but it didn't occur to anybody that no, nobody jumped out of their seat to go, oh, oh hey, well, I'll tr I'll try because they don't. No, you might have succeeded. Yeah. So no, we why had are you people trying? searching? Like, we had we had people searching rooms and poking around and trying different things, and everybody got to try the thing, and ev and the rest of us just assumed if the other person didn't find anything, there was nothing to be found. <laughs> we we didn't sit there and go, well, I don't know if Curtis is really searching. Step aside, Takashi. I'm searching this room now. No one did that, you know. And and Curtis and, and the other part, he's up front with me. You know, my rogue's doing the thing. He's following me at the cautious distance with the with the light. And I'm just playing the telephone game back to him what I see. He took it for literal. Whatever I told him is what he what I told him. And he's like, okay, nothing, nothing, nothing. That's just actually how my character scrolled away a, a sack full of coins because no one was there looking at me when I took it. <laughs> yeah. And even, you know. It was, it was, but anyway, apart from my chicanery there, it was, I, I liked it. it. It had me play better. And I think the the skill dog piling thing, I didn't even notice until you mentioned it now. Um, thanks to Hobbs there. Yeah. But I, I think it's, it didn't happen because we're all like, well, he tried. Why would I just walk up and do it for them? Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's no, there's no uh, urgent, like, you know, I'm not compelled to do it. 
You know, the other thing that we were doing too with that, and I think this aided and Tim doing this aided in this, I was doing all the scout things. My niche was to go listen, sneak and do. No one tried to do that with me or in place of me, even if I failed, because that was my job, right? Yeah. That's what I do well. When we had to identify some stuff, we looked to Hobbs Necromancer and in vain tried to get him to help us. <laughs> She's the world's worst necromancer, as we found out. World's worst sorcerer. Probably a good necromancer, terrible sorcerer. Anyway, point is, is when those things went to that character, no one else said, well, I can, can I do it instead of him? That, that never happened at all. Right. Any attempts, any of the ideas, anything that the people wanted to do. Um, who was that? Was that Jeff was playing the paladin? My buddy Jeff? No. Oh, no. Jeff. Who's... Cypher? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so Jeff's a paladin. He goes, well, as a paladin, I think I would know blah, 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 blah. And we went, okay. And you, even though you were masquerading as a cleric, no one else in the room said, oh, my character would also know religious stuff, too. It looks like he fucked that up. Can I try it? All the niche protection kind of fell into place. I don't know if that was just because, quite frankly, it was a really good group to play with. I'd love to play with all those folks again. That was fun. But I think um, I think that helps. And like kind of a knock-on effect, it really helped to do that. Now, I think I have talked to players, and some of them in my own group, that they don't like it. Because they believe that knowing the die roll helps them role play the result better. My usual response to that is, well, you can't do the, oh, I guess I lost, do, 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 do. don't know what's going to be on the secret door. You know, you, you can't do that. Um, but I have seen good players. And I, when I say that, my, it's not that my players aren't good, but I give them shit for that. But I have seen players like, okay, they fail. And they take that to um, to a role-playing place. And sometimes, quite frankly, I've seen it uh, fall very comedically. Where people are like, well, I must have earwax problems or I was listening to the wrong door or... God damn, I, I, you guys are just so fucking loud. Stupid fighter, if you wouldn't be clanking that armor, I could have heard the goblins man this door. Next time, sit fucking still. They turned it into an inter-party role-playing moment. And... The concept of having that die roll in your hands, your success, your, your success, your, your success or failure, success is when you combine the two. That's right. Um, your success your, is in your hands, right? Any dice that are going to impact your character's abilities, knowledge, go forward, go back attitude, whatever that is, is your fault. You know, you don't have to say, well, a DM, what if he fudge the dice? What if he's lying, right? You don't have to worry about that. Some And if you're rolling everything in the open, the game master rolls all the dice in the open. I mean, all the dice in the open? You're rolling everything in the open? Doesn't matter who fucking rolls it <laughs> at that point. Because if if we were using, we were not using an online die roller for that one, but if everything we did was all dice in the open, Tim rolling for us doesn't matter. Because there's nothing secret about it anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. So... Have you heard those arguments for it before, Sean? Like, hey, no, I want to do this because of those things. Like, I want, I feel like it's an agency thing. I want to be a master of my own dice destiny. Helps me role play. I don't trust the DM in some cases. I don't, you know, I don't see too many people at games that get hung up on a lot of that stuff, really. Um there's usually maybe one person, but that one person is usually a pain in the ass no matter what. <laughs> they're going to get hung up on whatever no matter. It, yeah, they're purposely <laughs> at the table just to kind of screw with you throughout the day. I'm waiting for something in this game to irk me. That, that irks me this evening. And, Bring me that thing. And I, think, I shall gripe about it. And I think that same per person or that type of person may not do it with a table full of strangers. Like if, oh. uh, so I have a friend of mine that I've known for a long time. And I know that what we're laying out here and you're, would you have a player that would get hung up on that stuff? He would, and he wouldn't do it because, well, wait a minute. I think I should be rolling that. Not you. I think uh -huh. it's a, it might be part of that. 
And then there's also a part of, well, I'm just going to kind of screw around at the table and push people's buttons. Yeah, there are people like that. <laughs> and so he does that, um, I think, I think sometimes he believes he's being just, wait a minute, I truly believe that's my role. I should be doing that role. Why are you doing that role? I should be yeah. doing that role. Come on, man. Come on, man. Hey, man. Yeah, yeah. And then it's like, all right, fine. Go ahead. Like, I'm not going to sit here and argue about it for 10 minutes. Let that <laughs> fine. It's not worth it. I get, I'm not going to die on that hill. Yeah, that's that. So I think I, you can say this flat right now is that there's some systems where this doesn't make any sense. If all the dice are in the player's hands, guess what? Right, I either have GM intrusions or something else. I mean, yeah. there are some systems where this discussion doesn't make a fucking bit of sense at all. No, right, and that's fine. I also think that there are some some settings where sometimes we don't always think about this because we tend to, at least in my space, I tend to think about this as a D and D or that fantasy setting when I look and search like a thief checking for stuff. And I tried to say it at the beginning, even in Shadowrun. You have Street Samurai is trying to figure something out, trying to hear a noise down the alleyway. That's just as right for Game Master Rolls Dice as Thief trying to hear hear noise. Or, you know, you're trying to smooth talk the police officer as the same thing as smooth talking the city guard or the bartender or whatever the case is. You know, so I think the set, it's not not even the setting. I think the system can stop you. But I don't think the setting would necessarily stop you. It is, um, it's just the style of play that if you're not used to. And I tell you, the thing that usually slows me down, and this is where I didn't have a chance. I wrote, made myself a note at the end of the game. I want to ask Tim what, how, he's do, how he keeps up on it is the bookkeeping piece of it. And this is where a lot of us as game masters, I feel, we start with a great aspiration of I'm going to keep track of everybody's skill checks so I can roll certain skill checks for everybody. And then about three levels in, we go, fuck, I haven't updated my chart. <laughs> I forgot. I forgot to update my chart. Some of a bitch. Okay, cool. Now, in these days uh, of online character sheets and so forth, I like if I was rolling roll 20, I could see everybody's character sheet as game master. So I could just look it up myself. I could roll the die on my table or something privately if I really want to keep it secret. Um, or you could ask characters to use like a DMs guild or or even if I could update a spreadsheet. There's a lot of different things in the Google Doc you could do to put the onus on people, but there's that chance, that risk, that the data you have is outdated. I think one of the ways to get around that is either as the game master, you build yourself some discipline to always do it, or there's a partnership discipline here that's like, I will ask you, I need you to give me, because you're going to go away, you're going to update your character sheet. At the start of every game, I'm going to ask you, did any of your skills change? If you say no, I will not update the sheet. If halfway through the game you say, ah, oh, fuck, I forgot, the answer is no, because I asked you at the beginning. I'm not retrofitting it because three quarters in this game, you just realized that you forgot to tell Brett you updated your stealth skill. Too fucking bad. Well, I would have made those last 20 stealth checks. I just forgot to tell you, you know, that time when you asked me specifically to my face, hey, Sean, did you update it? Yeah, I forgot to tell you. So, or I thought I didn't, but I really did. And, no, you have to be kind of black and white about it. But I think you can you can kind of do a partnership owner on up. But at the end of the day, it's bookkeeping that somebody or somebody's have to make sure that they're keeping track of. But, right? you, but you don't do you let them at that point adjust their skill and then move forward in the same in the same set. So session? in that in that scenario in that scenario, let's say it's you and me, and I said, Sean, and I asked the group, did anybody update their skill? Sean, nope. Blah 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 blah. Halfway through the game, Sean goes, oh, fuck. I actually did. I updated my stealth skill. I'd be like, no, too bad. Damn. I asked you hours ago, dude. No. However. Damn, that's harsh, I, man. I know. I'm just getting older and pissier. But um, you could say, all right, cool. But I'm not going back. I think, my, I, think I would take the harder line, Sean, if somebody wanted to bemoan the fact that that they shouldn't have failed, quote unquote, all those other checks earlier that evening or that other session. But that's on you, jackass. <laughs> well, I asked you, you didn't tell me. Um, but I could also see being lighter on it 
and saying, okay, cool, let's update it from this point forward. You have a plus five and not a plus four. Cool. Forgot to run. Uh, uh, hey, hey, who forgot to tell me? I forgot to tell you, Brad. Okay, good boy, Sean. Off we go. That type of thing. But I think at the end of it, it comes down to its bookkeeping and keeping track of notes and stuff is not always a game master's forte, even a player's forte. We all bemoan this and we all have a thousand different things that we think, we, oh, you know, this time, this time, there'll be online notes after every session. And this time I will update this thing and it, it falls. But what I think happens there is you've got to recognize it fell. And the only way to make sure that it doesn't is to update it then. So this goes to a lot of our role-playing practice stuff. I want to keep track of these private skills so I can roll these dice myself for you. We all agreed. We all thought it'd be great that Brett's going to do this. Sean, Eileen, everybody's in on board with it. And Eileen forgets, and or Brett forgets, and Sean forgets, whatever. I think what you do is you every time you forget, you correct the situation and move on. And eventually, you will develop that muscle and that habit to always do it. It'll just be a thing you have. Because I'm willing to bet that DeShane did not just wake up one day and say, hey, I'm going to do this really cool thing and I'll have this mastered. You mentioned at the beginning of this. He's obviously been doing it for a while and has a mechanism that works for Mr. Tim so he can get that cooking. Right. And what he's doing, I want to find out. I'm going to, so I'm going to ask him. And Tim, if when you hear this, if you could reply to us, that'd be great that we don't have to bug you privately. We can share it. Um, I may look at what Tim does and go, huh, I don't know if that'll work for me. However, I'm going to try it and then modify it as I go. But if it's something that you really want to get, it's kind of like when we talked about audio and other things, you got to try it. It's going to fucking fail at some point. You're going to try to say, God damn, I forgot to update X. All right, let's just stop the fight and get everybody's stuff updated good. Okay, sorry. Back to it. Off we go. Yeah, yeah. we're not winning Oscars here. There's no Emmy Awards up for anything, and we're not losing money. It's just time, and we're hanging out having fun anyway. So I think if it starts to fall apart on you, if nothing else, if the group is saying, I'm not having fun doing it this way, can we please stop? That's a different situation versus, oh, crap, I forgot again. God damn it, Brett. You forget every game. I know I'm a moron. Yes, you are a moron. Give me a goddamn, give me a goddamn bonuses. So, I mean, each of those has its own piece. But So, Sean, is this something you think you'd want to use? I mean, there's a lot of stuff you and I have talked about. Like, wow, this would be really cool to do. And this one, I, I think I want to try next time I get a, a campaign going. Well, no. Yeah, I want. I would try it, and I don't think I would have a problem implementing it. My question to you, Brett, would be, because you, you play a group with a group that's used to you and used to things roll in a particular way. So now you're going to change gears. Yeah. Now, unless you're starting a new game, like, hey, we're going to try... Low fantasy. We're going to try ASSH. You know, we haven't played that before. And then from that point forward, you decided, like, this is the way it's going to roll. Everybody's, you know what I'm saying? Like, if if you did it in a game you're currently running, are those guys going to say, hey, wait, hold on a second. I, like, we did it before this way. Now, now you're changing it, and it's the third session in this campaign? Yeah, it's not. It shouldn't be a big deal. Sure. But the other thing I like about what you're saying is that for me— it would be Astonishing Swordsman. I want to run it. So if I brought it to bear there, brand new game, brand new setting, we've not played in that before, it could be a great opportunity to try it. It's not the mechanics aren't that different than first or second edition AD. It's not hard. You played it. It's, it's easy enough. But it'd be a great opportunity for me to implement something different and then say, hey, you know that thing we did with, with Astonishing Swordsman? I want to do that when I run... Cthulhu, or I want to do that when I run Pathfinder, or when I run 5e. And people are like, yeah, sure, why not? Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, let's do that. I think this might be a case of a really good thing to throw into the next new game or the game you haven't run in a long time. System-wise, I'm talking game system here. Just because it's not, for, oh, I forgot we're doing it different now. Right. No, it's new. It's totally new. There's no, we just played 5e, now we're we're done with that. Now we're out of the abyss. And you're telling me we're doing that different because why again? It's weird to change gears in the middle of a game that you've been running for a month, two months or three or four sessions. Oh yeah. I kind of like this new thing. 
I don't want to do it the way we've been doing it the last, I don't know, 20 hours of play. So I hope you guys are all good with that, right? Like, My buddy Alpha has tried to do that a couple times in 5e as we we're kind of kicking the tires on it. They, oh, I want to try this. We're like, dude. Last, I think the last thing he did, I said, that's, really? How, how many more How many more hours of this we got? He said, well, I think you're almost done. I said, let's do this next time. He's like, okay, good point. <laughs> like, dude, we just figured out all the other crap you wanted to modify, modify, modify. And I think we would have been dead five, five, six sessions ago if we had implemented all these rules at once at the beginning. But yeah, not only in the middle of a campaign, but even in the middle of same system, same system, same system. Right. You know, if you've been Call of Cthulhu in for a long time, and then you jump back to D and yeah, everybody knows D and D and your crew. You've all played it before. Be like, hey, I want to do something different. I got a cool idea to try to make this D and D thing a little bit different. Let's try this. Or you've been D and D in the hell out of it, and you jump over to uh, you know a D stick D six Star Wars game or something else with with skill systems, <sighs> and even games that don't have skill systems. You know your BXs and such. Where a lot of things I was reading one of the old uh, Frank Menster boxes. Uh, books and it was talking about hey you know a skill check you know in the one to, in the three to eighteen skill range if you have a sixteen roll a d twenty sixteen or less and you succeed well that's a matter of keep track of everybody's stats in a game like that quite frankly the stats don't change all that much unless you get a magical item like gauntlets of overpower or something but I just I think this is um I think this is a pretty cool idea and one of the other things that it reminded me of is uh Back in the day, way, way back, like Grandpappy, Grognardi days, the DM rolled all the dice, like for everything. I've read uh, accounts of where the Game Master rolled up all your characters for you and gave them to you. What? This is the character you have. That's craziness. Everything. Yeah, you're, you narrated what you, want, what you want to do. I swing my sword at him. You know, try a series of feints and thrusts and when I cut for the jugular. Okay, he, the DM rolls the dice and explains to you what happened. Okay. But a lot of times, I mean, that's how I know some people played. I've met some of those folks. And I also know some other folks that when I mentioned it to them, they're like, huh, I was gaming at that time, but we all rolled our own dice. Mm-hmm. Because it was <laughs> just, you know. And I'm like, really? You all rolled your own dice? Well, I said, well, we all rolled the only two sets of dice we had. We passed them around the table, <laughs> but they not everybody had dice. You know, the first guy to get a 20-sider passed it around the table type of thing because... Ages and ages back, we didn't have a plethora of polyhedrals at our disposal, but it's it's interesting to see how it kind of changes. And then you take a game like Cypher System where, or Gumshoe and other very player-facing pieces where I push all the dice and all that dice agency, the randomizer agency, if you will, onto the players. It's a different way to go. And this is where I can see some people saying, I don't want to take that randomizer agency away from me. I want to hang on to that. I don't want to give that to the game master. And I think this is the piece when, if you're not, if you haven't tried it before, this is a very simple, don't knock it till you tried it. Maybe you do like broccoli, give it a shot. Um, and maybe you find out it tastes like crap <laughs> and you don't want it and you don't want it, but at least give it a go. And if you've not, if you have done it and you've had a really bad experience with it, my advice would be all my experiences in the past personally have been somebody failed at the bookkeeping. We just said, fuck it and moved on. It's, you know. If you've had a bad experience before, how long ago is that? Are those same people still playing? Do you really want to try it? You know, give it another go type of deal. But do you think you'd ever do this, Sean? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think so. Do you have plans to do this, Sean? Or are you just you just saying that to make me feel better? No. I mean, I think with the next game or whatever it is that I run, that I would um, look at things a little more clearer and see if it makes sense. When we're running games, uh, patching games, whatever, this is something we should come, we should talk about too. We go through the rest of this as like, hey, do you want to take a couple of these ideas and implement them? And this could be a fun one. So, cool, man. I might as well, like, I don't know, take something that we actually come up with or, or discuss, I should say. We didn't come up with this stuff, but something we discuss and... I don't know. Actually, try it out. I don't know. See what happens. <laughs> actually, imp- implement this bullshit we've been spewing for, what, six years? <laughs> Holy crap. They actually did the thing they said in episode two. Neat. <laughs> well, folks, if you've had this work or not work, or better yet, quite frankly, if you've got a mechanism 
a tool set? How are you doing it? Um, and if you're like, hey, it only works for me in this game system, that's fine. Not knocking that. But if you've got a tool that says, hey, whenever I'm running D&D 5e, I always do this to get the info from my players. Or how are you keeping track of it? What are you doing? That would be great to hear so we could share that stuff around the old uh, gaming BS campfire here. So that'd be cool. You good, man? Dude, I'm good, man. Let's get into right, die, roll. die roll. What do you up. say, Brett? Die roll? I like it. Yeah, let's get the die, die roll. is fun. Oh, my God. That's really loud. All right. Die roll. Segment of the show where we 2d4 miscellaneous points of gaming and geekery we want to bring to you. We've got four this week. Uh, first one, Con of Champions. May 23rd to the 25th, 2020. Um, that's being put on by the folks over at Tabletop Events. So the proceeds goes towards keeping tabletop events alive and kicking during these times. So thanks. Yeah, to- I've used to, yeah JT and the guys that do this. <laughs> they've announced that they're shutting down May first. Oh, this they, is a fact. They announced that. We had announced. Oh, they- that we were going to shut down May first, but our community has loudly stated clearly that they do not want us to shut down. That we should run the crowdfunding campaign to help keep them going during the pandemic. So here's the deal. They're not making any fucking money at like at all for that component of their business <laughs> because tabletop events, guess what? There's no events happening. Gary Khan uses them. I got a hold of the Evercon team and I said, hey, guys, as you're shifting leadership and doing things, be aware. If this software isn't available to you, this is going to be a son of a bitch because tabletop events, for me anyway, that is one of the things that helped my partners and I take Evercon from where it was to the next level. Gary Khan uses it. These are a modified version of it, but I mean, a lot of different gaming conventions use this system, and it is a rock solid system. Use it as as intended. It just fucking works. So it's um it's really cool. I'd love to see these guys stay alive. So I'm thinking of um, seeing if I can just donate some money if I can't make the virtual convention. You know how to from a timing perspective. If you'd like to throw some cash their way this would be a good time to help help a good good group of people that produce a goddamn good product for the gaming community so anyway that's my bet yeah it's got some really really cool features in it so that's yeah, good robust so check that out there's they also have a list of things that you know if you support them they they're not doing a kickstarter because they have the people they have the audience to blast this out to because it's everybody that's ever registered for a game through their platform, um, and they just don't want to give Kickstarter five percent for something that they don't need to. So um, I think they're they've got a list of stuff that you can actually. I think if you contribute so much, you, I don't know, you get a date with Brad or something. I don't know. It's goofy. But oh, jeez, nobody know. wants that. No, so, uh, let's see what else. Next one, the Halls of Arden Vol. It's a mega dungeon published by Expeditious Retreat. It's um, authored by Richard Barton, uh, Chris Shorb's friend. This thing is no joke, ladies and gentlemen. You can find it on DriveThru. We'll have a link to it. It is not cheap, but it's also very large. Uh, 2,162 encounter descriptions. 14 NPC factions, 10 massive levels, 15 extensive sub-levels, 7 dangerous exterior locations, 149 new monsters. Uh, it's This thing's a beast. So Wow. Yeah, a full NPC appendix with 10 competing parties at 3 levels of power, over 140 original pieces of art, including 28 full-page illustrations. So definitely a lot of production behind it. Uh, we'll have a link also to the maps on drive through, which is pay uh, what you want for those. And then there's an, also a link to a blog entry where somebody actually interviewed Richard about the product so you can find out more about it. So um, it looks pretty cool for sure. Very nice. Yeah, it's big. And then uh, another one, Rollgate. Have you heard of Rollgate before, Brett? I have not. What is Rollgate, man? It's an online in character, out of character chat tool. So I thought it's nothing crazy robust, but you know, if you haven't heard of it, some oh. folks in the forums oh. were talking about it. I had never heard of it before, so I figured I'd throw it out there. So um I think 
yeah, it's like a play by post is what Hobbs puts out there, which is neat. Yeah. So another resource for everybody to take a look at. And then the last one, Map Keeper, which is a map tool Tim Deshane used for our ASSH online game this past Saturday, which we'll have a video up on YouTube. Uh, I'll probably put a link to that so you're wondering what I'm talking about. We used Zoom uh, to stream to Twitch and to communicate with everybody. But Tim had this cool tool where it's literally you upload a map as a picture, and then you take your finger across your tablet and just... It's fog of war. It basically blacks yeah. the map out, and then you just erase yes. what pieces you want to show the party. It's awesome. Yeah. I, it's iOS only. My buddy, um, I found it a while back, shared with with Alpha and my game group, and that's what we use when we're in-person gaming. Sure. So it's it's pretty damn cool. And the, the nice thing about it is it's any map. It doesn't have to be scaled, blah, blah, blah. It's any map, any picture. And then you want to slap it on there and scrub away the black and show everybody what they, what it is a character sees. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it allows you to scroll Mm-hmm. You know, around the map. So, yeah. And then there's, what, announcing Cyclops Con, I think. Oh, that's right. Goodman Games. We'll put that in there. Thanks, Hobbs. Um, Goodman Games is announcing Cyclops Con. Oh, that's right. I saw that. Yeah. And uh, that's going to be April 17th to the 19th. And it's an entirely online con. Uh, so everybody in the world can participate. They need to support. Uh, all Goodman Games product lines, DCC, DCC Lankmar, uh, MCC, which is Mutant Crawl Classics, uh, Metamorph- Metamorphosis, Alpha, Metamorphosis Alpha, as well as 5E. So, um, so we'll see about that. Cyclops Con, check that out as well. We'll have a link in the show notes for that one. Thanks, Hobbs. But otherwise, I think that's it, Brett. Cool, man. Yeah. I think we're good. What are we talking about next week, you know? I'm not sure yet. I was going to get my kids on the mics tonight, but I had this other thing to talk about, and then the kids have been super busy running around like little munchkins that they are. So I might grab uh, AJ and Lana and get them on so we can talk about gaming and kids stuff and what they like about it and all that good Yeah, crap. I have to figure out how to do that. Yeah, I mean, I've got another mic here, like the one I've got, the CT, hmm. that you'd lend me. So I have that, so I could have them kind of lean in and swap back and forth, but... They won't have very good mic discipline, so I'm trying to figure out <laughs> if I just grab one of them at a time or or I get one of them with a earbuds and a throat mic. I don't know. Not necessarily the nicest way to go, but we'll figure something yeah, out. Yeah, we'll figure if it we, out. If I can pull it off. Right. If not, we shall see. I've got a couple different ideas, Bruin. and I will throw a few things at you, Sean. Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks, everybody that's tuned in via Discord as well as Twitch. You can catch us at gamingandbs.com forward slash Twitch. If you want to see us, we don't have like a steady, hey, we're doing it Mondays at 7. Brett and I kind of re- roll free flowing at the moment until we mm-hmm. pin down and schedules start to kind of solidify. Yeah, calm down a bit. But otherwise, I'm Sean. And I'm Brett. Good night and good game and all. This episode of Gaming and BS brought to you with the help from the following BSers. Graham Miner, Corey Wynn, Michael Dinos, Joe Swick, Curtis Takahashi, Aaron Ralia, Corey Welch, Larry Hout, Mark Tasaka, Pure Mongrel, Chris Steele, Ron Bishop, Thomas Hook, Wayne Humphrey, Craig, Brandon Barnes, Laramie Wall, Dan LaValley, Jason Hobbs, Guy, Old School DM, Perry Besor, Jim Fitzpatrick, Christopher Gray, John Kayward, Corey Gonzalez, Eileen Barnes, Robert Nemeth, Niall Diamond, Howard Bishop, Eric Salzweedle, The Closet Gamer, Jeff Goad, Ari Otis, C.W. Mellencamp, Craig Huber, Old Scouser Roleplaying, Jared Rasher, Andy Hall, David F. Baylog, Harrigan, Melissa Bashinsky, Brian Rumble, Henry Newcomb, Eric Talvola, Hus Carl, Roger Brassett, Mark Soam, Andy Olson, Eric Avia, Ron Blessing, Jeff Seifert, Ghost GM, Mike Hess Jr., Angus, Tony Sugarloaf Baker, Rory Weston, Curtis Hinson, Jim Ingram, Kurt Dirtilis, aka Dan, Chad Glayman, Finolf, Josh Wallace, Merkel Froilich, and Rich Wishon. Hey, do us a favor. If you've liked what you've heard on this show, go tell somebody about it. Have them subscribe or give us a listen. Head over to gamingandbs.com forward slash subscribe. Thanks, BSers! This This has has been been a Litterbox Studio production. production.